keynote speaker for today. Christian, Özgü, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, STPC chairs, we also would like to welcome you to the MNCs uh, main track. Uh, we would have loved to have the opportunity to, to be in Istanbul and enjoy the beautiful city, but hopefully we, we will manage to do this next year. So uh, it's our pleasure to, to uh, welcome uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Mohamed Alizadeh. Uh, he will be basically talking in a very interesting topic on the intersection of uh, applications and uh, applications and transport uh, protocols. Uh, please make sure that uh, post your questions in Slido uh, and it will be streamed on YouTube. Uh, I would like to now pass the uh, microphone to Christian to, to introduce him. Uh, yes. Uh, Welcome also from my side. Uh, thank you, Özgür, uh, for this kind introduction. And uh, we have truly a very interesting uh, keynote speaker right now. Uh, Mohamed Ali Sade uh, is a, a professor at uh, MIT uh, in the US, and he will work on a he will present on a topic uh, which is uh, really interesting, especially in uh, these periods. Uh, if you just look at the numbers uh, in terms of the the, the streaming that increased in the past couple of months. Uh, it's a very impressive number. Uh, but uh, uh, Mohammed did not only work on that in, on, from a theoretical point of view, uh, he is also known uh, for uh, his contributions, which are now actually available in various products and services. Uh, you can look up to our uh, MMSUS website uh, where you can read his uh, bio, which includes some truly uh, impressive contributions from research and academia to the industry, uh, which I think makes also MMSUS a very special event because it's also the place uh, where uh, academia and uh, industry meets. And uh, without any further delay, uh, let's unmute Mohammed. And if you could start sharing your screen, uh, that yes. would be awesome. Thank you. Welcome uh, to MMSIS 2020. So, so can you see? Yes. Let's see. yes. Looks fine. If... Looks good. Okay. okay. Looks very good. Okay. Go All right. Ahead. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. Um, it's uh, great to be uh, uh, with you all today. Um, uh, so I'd like to talk today about some work that we've been doing um, really over the last few years on video streaming algorithms and transport protocols that make use of rich contextual information about a video stream to make better decisions and improve uh, user quality of experience. Um, so to set the stage, let's see, okay, there we go. So to set the stage for this talk, um, let me start with sort of describing what I mean by video stream context. So context is really any information that you have about a particular video stream. What type of network are we streaming on? Is this a home Wi-Fi network, a cellular network, some kind of public network like at an airport? Um, what is the viewing device? Is it a large screen TV, a mobile phone, a laptop? Um, what's the nature of the video content itself? Is this um, you know, a sports video, an animated movie, some um, high paced action movie? Um, and dynamic state associated with the session. Um, things like the state of the video player, like how much playback buffer it has at a point in time. Um, what's the nature of competing traffic on the network? Is this video competing with other video traffic or competing with other types of traffic like web traffic. So all of this contextual information can be very useful when making decisions about a video stream in particular, having to do with how to deal with network congestion and network bottlenecks. But today's video streaming systems don't yet make good use of all this contextual information. So just to set the stage for this, I know this will be uh, something that's familiar to uh, most of you, 
Uh, let's talk a little bit about the basic architecture of a dynamic streaming over HTTP uh, video delivery system. So as you all know, uh, in uh, dynamic streaming over HTTP or Dash, we take video, we split it into these chunks that are a few seconds of video each, and we encode each, each chunk at multiple different bit rates and we place those chunks on a video server. Now the client um, every few seconds will fetch, you know, will basically send a request for a particular chunk and it gets to decide at what bit rate it wants to download each chunk at. So this is the purpose of what are called adaptive bit rate algorithms. That's basically a control policy running on a video player that's dynamically determining the resolution of video based on network conditions. Now there's another control algorithm also running in these systems, which is uh, the congestion control algorithm running in the transport protocol layer. Um, so as a video server is sending data over the network, it's the job of the transport protocol and its congestion control mechanism to determine at what rate it can send video, it, it can send data at, uh, at any point in time. And these two control loops are sort of the key mechanisms for um, determining how bandwidth is used during a video stream. The problem is that there's this semantic gap between video applications and the network. You know, today a video application and, and, and the underlying network protocols exchange almost no information directly. If you look at adaptive bit rate algorithms, um, the only thing they really know about the network is they observe how long it takes to download a chunk of video. Um, they typically use that to estimate the network rate and that's pretty much it. Uh, perhaps more importantly, adaptive bit rate algorithms um, in most cases are just fixed control algorithms that are deployed and then used on um, essentially a wide variety of networks. Uh, the same control mechanism that is being used on a highly variable cellular network is used on some kind of more stable, maybe broadband network. Switching over to transfer protocols, from the transfer protocol perspective, video is just like any other application. The transfer protocol doesn't even really know that the data that it's sending is video. It has no knowledge of uh, things like the state of a video player, the any quality of experience metrics associated with the stream. Um, and so typically, for instance, in terms of congestion control, uh, what we end up doing is we, we use generic congestion control algorithms like TCP congestion control, which aim to provide some kind of connection level bandwidth uh, fairness. So, with that overview in this talk, uh, I would like to describe two systems that make better use of uh, this rich contextual information um, for uh, both at the ABR uh, layer and at the congestion control layer. I'll first briefly talk about um, a system we developed a few years ago called Pensieve that uses machine learning to learn network specific bit rate adaptation algorithms. And then I'll talk about a more recent system called Minerva that is a quality of experience aware congestion control algorithm for uh, video specifically. So let me start with uh, Pensieve. So Pensieve is a system that uh, uses reinforcement learning to learn a bit rate adaptation algorithms automatically through experience. Pensieve represents a bit rate adaptation uh, policy using a neural network that takes as input observations about current network conditions and the state of a video player and makes decisions about what resolution to um, download video uh, at for the next chunk. Um, by training this neural network using um, thousands of video streaming sessions for a particular network, Pensy can link, tailor its policy specifically for the characteristics of individual networks. So for example, it can learn a policy that understands the frequency and duration of outages in a cellular network and um, optimizes its decision for that. And because of this, um, Pensieve can perform significantly better than sort of traditional handcrafted control algorithms, uh, spe specifically in challenging network scenarios like time varying cellular networks. Uh, so to uh, give you uh, sort of an illustration of the kinds of things that a system like Pensive can learn, um, let me show you a little demo. So this is a particular network trace. Um, this is from a 3G uh, uh, network. It's a publicly available data set that was connected, that was collected in Norway. 
And you can see that these networks, um, there's a sort of a certain chance of having an outage where the throughput of the network degrades significantly. And what we're gonna do is we're going to stream video over this network um, using PenC for ABR versus um, a model predictive control uh, based uh, algorithm as a baseline. And the top plot in red shows the video buffer occupancy for Pensieve. The bottom one shows the client buffer occupancy for MPC. So as I start this stream, you can see that initially the network conditions are pretty good. The throughput is decent. And so both schemes you know, will switch up in quality. We'll go to higher resolutions. Um, but Pensieve sort of is a little bit more conservative. It switches a little bit more slowly. Um, and so when the uh, outage occurs, it has more playback buffer and it avoids this, this rebuffering event. Whereas MPC ran out of buffer and, it, and the video stalled. Now, I wanna emphasize Pensieve is not actually predicting that there's going to be an outage at a certain exact point in time. In its training, it has seen so many examples of traces in this, from this network that it's learned the characteristics of it. So it's learned um, something about how much buffer it needs to mitigate the risk of rebuffering um, in the typical case. Okay, so how does this system work? Um, so as I mentioned, the Pensieve uh, learns uh, an ABR algorithm through reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, you have an agent that's going to learn by sequentially make, taking actions in an environment and then observing the effect of those actions. In this case, the environment is the video player itself and the network that you're streaming over. Um, and what's going to happen is uh, for every chunk download, uh, the agent is going to observe some state of this environment. It's going to observe um, things like what is the throughput achieved over the last um, several chunks? Um, how long did it take to download those chunks? Um, what is the size of the next chunk at different bitrate levels that are available? How much playback buffer um, uh, do I currently have available? And so on. And it's going to use this state to take an action, which in this case is simply, what is the bitrate that you should use for the downloading the next chunk? And during its training process, the system is trained using a reward signal that tells it how well it's doing, this can be any perceptual quality um, metric that you'd like. Uh, in our case, we use, um, for training this, we use a standard sort of QoE metric that has a, a reward for higher bit rates and penalties for rebuffering and, and uh, violating smoothness. So as I mentioned, Pensieve makes decisions using a neural network that goes from these states to actions I won't go through the details of this architecture. It's fairly simple. It has these one-dimensional convolutional filters that operates on the time series data, and then um, a couple of hidden layers, and finally a decision layer. Okay, so how do we train this system? We start with a large corpus of network traces um, from the network that we wish to optimize over. And we can actually train this entire system in uh, a simulator. So in our system, we built uh, uh, a simple parallel simulator where you have these workers that are going to randomly sample a trace from your data set, randomly sample a video, and they're going to simulate what happens when you stream that video with the current ABR policy um, on that network trace. Um, they'll output their experience data, sort of what, what happened, what are these QoE metrics that you achieved um, to a central node that's, periodically collecting this information, running a reinforcement learning algorithm to improve the policy and it will update the policy. Um, and then this whole process will repeat for some number of iterations until this model converges. So let me show you a few results. Uh, so this is from our trace-driven evaluation in the original um, paper that we published. So these are two data sets. Um, uh, one is this uh, 3G cellular data set that I mentioned earlier, and the other is uh, a broadband home, home broadband network data set. And in this evaluation, we're basically taking some uh, percentage of those traces we're, as, as training data, and then we're going to test on uh, remaining traces. Um, and uh, you know, we, we're going to, this is an emulation run using an actual dash.js 
video player um, in, inside Chrome. Um, and uh, the network links are emulated using Mahi Mahi. So as I mentioned, you know, we're looking at a QoE metric that has these three components, um, your bitrate utility, um, penalties for rebuffering and smoothness. And what this chart is showing, <coughs> excuse me. what this chart is showing is um, how Pensive compares to um, a number of baselines across these three um, metrics. So you can see that in terms of average bit rate, it's comparable to uh, schemes like a buffer-based ABR algorithm or model predictive control, but it's able to reduce rebuffering and, and also get a lower smoothness, uh, sort of better smoothness than these schemes. In these evaluations, we found overall that Pensive can reduce rebuffering by 10 to 32% over the second best you know, algorithm, which was a, an MPC-based approach. We also spent some time collaborating with Facebook to deploy Pensive uh, in their web-based video platform. Um, it, so the results I'm going to show are from a one-week trial of a reinforcement learning-based ABR policy at Facebook that was trained essentially in, in a very similar manner to the, to, the, to, the, to the way I described, but using a huge corpus of network traces collected from Facebook's web-based video platform. So this is only from the website, uh, not on their mobile application. Um, and in trying to deploy a learning-based policy uh, in a real-world environment, we found sort of we ran into several like practical considerations that are described in more detail in this paper. But just to give you a flavor of things that we had to deal with, um, so you know, Pensive is learning this kind of you know learn neural network policy. But it's very desirable in practice to have something that's easier to interpret and we can understand um, more simply what it's doing. So we went through this process of taking this nonlinear policy uh, that is learned using reinforcement learning and translating it into something that's interpretable. In this case, we translated it into linear policies uh, that looked at past uh, throughput observations and, and, and the playback buffer. Um, we also found that uh, this process of actually defining a good reward signal um, in practice can be pretty tricky because in their environment, uh, so they, there's an existing ABR policy. And if you want some better policy, you really have to beat that default policy across multiple dimensions. You know, you have to have at least as good uh, bit rate, at least as good uh, uh, rebuffering ratio. And as you recall, you know, in, in, in our reward signal, we need to combine these different objectives into a single scalar reward. And it's not easy to know how to combine them so that you actually end up beating some existing policy across multiple dimensions. So we uh, came up with this approach to based on Bayesian optimization that basically tunes the weights of that reward signal during the training process until we see that it's actually, uh, you know, it's achieving kind of the, the desired point on the predictive frontier that we want. Uh, details of this are in the paper. So um, here's the overall results for this week-long experiment with about 30 million users at Facebook. Um, and what it's showing is um, the learned policy compared to the default policy that was deployed at Facebook in terms of video quality and stall rate. And you can see on average, we're getting consistently better, you know, every, every day we're getting consistently better video quality. There's about a 2% improvement in video quality um, with a small improvement in stall rate. Um, so, you know, these numbers look, kind of small, certainly smaller than like improvements that you can get over, you know, a challenging sort of variable seller network data set. But that's to be expected. I mean, this is a web-based, you know, platform. Um, a lot of people are, you know, watching video in their browser, um, on their laptops, you know, or, 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 or home desktops, or pretty well-connected networks. So overall, uh, you know, there's a lot of networks where ABR is actually fairly straightforward to do. But if we look at the breakdown of this, for instance, over uh, the more challenging scenarios in, this, in these sessions, you know, sessions that had a, a, a lower average bandwidth. So for example, average bandwidth less than 500 kilobits per second, you can see that the improvements become more significant. And this is really where you know, uh, as an intelligent ABR is going to give you the biggest benefits. So here we see about 6% improvement in video quality and about a two and a half to 3% reduction in stall rate compared to their compared to the default um, policy that was deployed. And of course, on fast networks, as expected, 
uh, you know, these different ABR policies work pretty much similarly. Okay, so that's what I want to say about Pensieve. Let me now switch gears a little bit and talk about this transfer protocol uh, called Minerva. So the motivation for this work was that streaming video uh, you know, is poised to continue growing over the next few years. Um, the estimates from Cisco suggest, for instance, that by 2021, 82% uh, of traffic worldwide um, is going to be uh, video. The scale of video is important because it means that when I'm using the network and my video is competing with some other traffic at a, at a bottleneck, it's likely that actually that other traffic is also video. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of these scenarios where there's multiple video streams sharing a network in this way. So think of a house where say multiple people may be watching Netflix during the evening or an office or college dorm where many people uh, could be watching YouTube at the same time. Now, most of this work on video streaming, like for instance, the work on ABR focuses on a single video in isolation, a single stream in isolation, it paying no special attention to the other traffic that's sharing the link. But we can actually do more if we know that other video streams are sharing the link. So for instance, we can adjust the bandwidth share achieved by these different video streams to co-optimize their performance together. Um, and there are two ways that this can help, um, taking advantage of both the nature of video content and playback session differences between different video streams. So let's first look at content-based differences. Um, this is a screenshot from a documentary about Tesla at 1080p and 240p resolutions. And you can see some differences clearly between these. So Elon Musk's face is more pixelated on the right-hand side, but both are pretty good. I mean, it's, the differences are kind of minor here. But if you look at the, uh, this example the, of uh, two stills from a panoramic you know, nature shot, the visual quality of the frame on the right now is much worse than the frame on the left. The text is blurry. We can't really see any of the fine details on the houses and boats. So in this case, a drop in resolution for this video will result in much worse uh, quality of experience than a drop in the Tesla documentary. But you don't have to just take my word for it. There are, of course, metrics that you know, quantify a video's visual quality. One of them is called VMAF, uh, which is designed by Netflix. So here are the VMAF scores for these frames. Um, and uh, this confirms as we expected that uh, if the resolution drops, this nature video will suffer a lot more um, from a perceptual quality standpoint. What this means is that different videos value bandwidth differently. So in general, of course, videos are divided into these chunks and as we saw, as we saw before and the uh, for every bit rate of every chunk, there's a different visual quality metric. So even in a single video, the quality can vary a lot between adjacent chunks of the video. So in addition to these content-based differences, two video sessions that are sharing the network can have dynamic differences um, depending the state of their players. So in this example, consider let's say two identical videos where one of them has built up a large playback buffer um, and the other one has a small buffer. So with the traditional congestion control algorithm like TCP, uh, the two videos will roughly get an equal bandwidth split when they compete, um, as you can see in the bottom of this graph. But when the network cuts out, the video on the right will end up stalling after every chunk, whereas the video on the left has a lot of playback buffer to begin with, so it can actually sustain, it, it will be fine for, for a decent amount of time. So what we could do by considering a dynamic state, uh, what, what can we do by considering this dynamic state into account or by taking it into account? So if we knew that the video on the right had low playback buffer, um, we could actually shift more bandwidth over to it to prevent it from rebuffering, which as you can see is a much better viewing experience. The video on the left, which had a lot of playback buffer is, doesn't really get affected too much. 
Um, the only difference is that now its buffer drains faster. So what we effectively done is we've allowed the uh, right-hand video to tap in into the buffer pool that's available on the, on the other video um, and, and use up more bandwidth. Um, and what I'm showing here is actually uh, our solution at work. Uh, and it goes to shows that we can um, avoid stalling on, on excessive stalling if we were somehow able to get videos to effectively cooperate and um, uh, settle on a bandwidth allocation that is actually based on their needs in real time. So in this project, what we were interested in is really what if video providers could allocate bandwidth to their video streams based on quality of experience metrics. Um, this kind of objective, which takes into account the experience of multiple video clients is called quality of experience fairness or QE fairness. And there are many types of QE fairness metrics you can imagine. Uh, for concreteness, I'm going to talk about max min QE fairness, but the system that we designed is actually general and can support other notions of fairness as well. The goal of max min fairness is to improve the experience for the, the, the video client that is the worst off. Um, so whereas a traditional congestion control protocol like Cubic and Reno will divide the link bandwidth equally, resulting in very different visual experiences for different clients. Um, what we want to do is actually have a system that will uh, optimize for QE fairness by giving clients different shares of the link bandwidth to get them to have the same QE. So there are prior schemes to do this that essentially take a centralized approach. You know, so one way to achieving this directly is to enforce the rate allocation that you want by having a controller at a switch or router. Um, this solution requires that clients know about the controller and feed it updates about their client state, like their current session buffer level. And in fact, there's prior work that takes exactly this approach. But this isn't all that easy to deploy um, <laughs> because it requires instrumenting every link that could be the bottleneck with the specialized controller um, and notice that in general, the bottom link, link could be really anywhere in the network and could even change during the course of a video. So the system that we have, Minerva, solves exactly this problem. Um, video providers can choose to deploy Minerva in, uh, for their videos in place of TCP congestion control to achieve maximum fairness whenever any of them share a bottleneck link. Most importantly, Minerva is easy to deploy. It only requires changing the server and client endpoints, not anything inside the network in the switches or routers. Minerva also requires no explicit communication between the clients. In fact, the clients don't even need to know about each other's existence. This is important because bottlenecks, as explained, may change over time. So clients should be able to adapt gracefully regardless of what other videos happen to be sharing their bottleneck. Um, and since Minerva runs over a wider network that has other traffic, it's important for it to compete fairly with non-Minerva traffic. And we've designed this protocol so that it's fair on average to non-video traffic sharing the link. So to describe how Minerva works, let's consider this simple setup with two clients streaming videos from two different video servers. These clients happen to share a bottleneck, bottleneck link somewhere in the network. So there are two key components to this system. First, um, the clients will compute its, each client computes its expected utility. This is a function like this, which captures how much that client values bandwidth at that point in time. The utility function is a function of the rate that the client measures and also depends on its current buffer level. Rate and buffer determine a unique point on this curve and then each client will move to different points on this curve depending on its current download rate and how much buffer it has built up. Um, and recall that the goal of Minerva is for all clients to find a point on their individual curves with the same utility. But how do they do that? To see, give the high level intuition for how this is possible, let's consider two clients, Alice and Bob, 
with the following utility curves um, and who start off with equal shares of a link. At this current rate allocation, Alice's utility is higher than Bob's. So we want her bandwidth to decrease and Bob's to increase so that their utilities become equal. But the key is that they have to coordinate this bandwidth allocation without ever talking explicitly with each other. Remember, they don't even know that the other client exists and is sharing the link. So they do this by changing how aggressively they compete for bandwidth based on their current utility. For instance, suppose the underlying congestion control algorithm is Reno. So you have this characteristic sawtooth pattern of Reno. Bob is going to tell his congestion controller to be more aggressive and Alice tells her to be less so. Therefore, Alice's rate will decrease relative to Bob, moving them on their utility curves. Um, but one step of this may not be enough. So this process continues iteratively um, until Alice and Bob find a rate where their two utilities uh, are identical. The entire process for doing this is actually distributed. Alice and Bob never have to actually communicate directly with each other. So now let me dig a little deeper into these two steps of Minerva to explain how this works. Um, so first let's look at how clients actually compute their utilities. <clears throat> so the utility function aims to estimate the QOE that a client will get over the entire video, assuming it's able to maintain a certain download rate R. Since the video is uh, a series of chunks, we can think of this QOE as being contributed from some set of past chunks that we've already watched, the current one we're downloading, and the ones in the future. Um, and we use this standard definition of QOE, like I showed before, that has a perceptual quality term, uh, a rebuffering term, and uh, a penalty for uh, switching between different bid rates. So the client already knows the QOE for the chunks that it has downloaded in the past, and it's straightforward to estimate the QOE for the current chunk. Um, the challenge is that for the future chunks, um, because it's not even clear what bit rate we're going to be downloading those chunks at, that depends on the ABR algorithm that we're using. So the way we handle this in Minerva is we treat the ABR as a black box algorithm that takes some state like the network you know, uh, state and the buffer occupancy and previous chunk bit rate level and outputs what the next bit rate will be. Um, assuming we maintain the download rate R. So if we can simulate the ABR in this manner, we will get the predicted quality of the next chunk. Um, and then we can update the client state, plugging it back into the ABR. Uh, and this can continue for some number of iterations. We're essentially forward simulating estimating what the quality is going to be if we're able to maintain a certain rate R over some horizon of future chunks. Um, so putting this together, this uh, gives us an average QOE uh, considering some horizon of future chunks at this, at this current rate. And that's how we get this utility curve. Okay, now that we have these utility curves, how do we actually use them to influence the congestion control? Um, so we break down this task into two steps. Um, first, we compute a weight for each client based on its utility curve. The goal is that clients that, um, the clients should achieve rates that are in proportion to these weights. Um, second, we will modify the underlying protocol like Reno or Cubic to use this weight parameter to modulate how aggressive it's going to behave on the network. So for example, if Minerva was deployed on top of Reno, um, Reno would receive a weight, say of 2.5 and use it to adjust its additive increase multiplicative decrease constants so that its steady state throughput is two and a half times what a standard Reno flow would get. Um, so now the question becomes, how do we come up with this weight for each client? Minerva's weight update rule is simple. Um, it's the measured download rate um, at a particular point in time divided by the expected utility at that rate that we measured in using our utility curves. Intuitively, what this rule does is it means that a client with a low utility will get a higher weight, 
which gives it a larger share of the link bandwidth, which in turn should increase its utility. It can be seen that this process has a fixed point. Um, once it reaches a state where the utilities of all the clients are equal, the weights will no longer change. And that's exactly the maximum fairness condition. So in the paper, we prove that this iterative procedure will converge to a maximum fair allocation um, in a logarithmic number of steps, depending on some loose conditions on the client utility functions. Okay, this weight after rule that I described has just one final problem. Um, the way this is written, the weight depends on the scale of the utility function, which is something that's arbitrary. Let me explain. So let's consider what the distribution of weights for a provider's videos at any point in time might look like. Um, so for instance, maybe this provider has sort of weights that are between 0.5 and one, um, but that scale is completely arbitrary. If the provider decided to scale its utility functions by some factor like, a, like one third, then its weights would be three times larger. So it would be between 1.5 and three now. What that means is that when this provider's clients now compete with other traffic, they would hog too much bandwidth. They would be as aggressive as something between 1.5 times the TCP flow to three times the TCP flow. So the way we fix this is we add um, a normalization function f in the calculation of these weights. Um, this function f is applied the same way, in the same way for all the videos for a provider. And the way it's chosen is it's chosen such that the average weight uh, of a video across that data set is going to be one. So this means that on average, a provider using Minerva will have a bandwidth footprint that is unchanged compared to if it was using some baseline algorithm like Cubic or Reno. For more details of this, I'm gonna refer you to the paper. So let me just show you a few results and then I'll conclude. So in our implementation of this, we built a, a uh, you know, the video server is an HTTP server built on top of Quick. Um, and the video client is uh, a Chrome browser running dash.js. We use a model predictive control for ABR in these experiments. So we ran experiments using a corpus of 19 videos from various genres, um, from animated movies to action scenes, to documentaries and news, to high definition nature shots. Um, every video uh, chunks perceptual quality is measured using um, VMAF, which is the metric that I mentioned defined by Netflix. It's a prediction of how users would rate the visual quality. So VMAF um, is on a scale of zero to 100, with 100 being the quality of a reference 4K video. Um, to give you a sense of these numbers, um, uh, for this talk, I'm gonna look at sort of the difference in VMAF scores between 720p and 1080p, which is approximately 7.65 in our data set. Um, we'll use this as a sort of a benchmark to compare any improvement against. Um, so the first question here is, can Minerva actually improve QoE fairness? Uh, to answer this, let's look at a sort of a simple scenario where you have four clients, um, four, basically four video streams using Minerva, and we're going to show what happens, what, what, the, what QoEs they achieve using different congestion control algorithms. So uh, this is for a specific combination of four videos. Um, and let's look at cubic first. The top of these red bars represent the minimum QoE among the four flows. And the top of the black whisker is the maximum QoE among the four flows. So you can see that there's a spread in the QoE um, because cubic is splitting bandwidth equally, not based on QoE. Um, a scheme like BBR doesn't do any better. In fact, we found BBR to generally be worse in terms of fairness, and it's even unfair to itself. Um, Minerva outperforms these alternatives. You can see it reduces the spread between the worst and the best video, uh, which is what, 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 what we aim to do. Um, now, this graph is only um, for a single combination of four videos. We repeated this kind of experiment for many randomly chosen combination of videos, and um, what we found overall is in 17 to 35% of the scenarios, 
um, the worst off video sees a 7.5, six point increase in its VMAF score. So remember that that's sort of equivalent to a jump between about 720p quality and 1080p quality. Now, this opportunity for improvement really depends on the scenario, it depends on the context. So if you have, let's say some set of videos sharing a link that all have very similar um, uh, you know, perceptual quality curves, then the room for this kind of optimization is gonna be small because uh, equal sharing of bandwidth is also gonna give you good QE fairness. But when you have videos that are on opposite sides of this quality spectrum, there's a large room for improvement. We also tested Minerva in the wild by running it over a residential network in Boston. In these experiments, we have uh, four Minerva, uh, four videos using Minerva and the same videos concurrently running using Cubic. Um, and we repeated this experiment 23 times. Um, what the plot is showing for each run is the perceptual quality, is the VMAF score, uh, sorry, actually the QE metric achieved using the cubic for the four videos. And you can see that there's, again, there's a spread. In, notice that in some of the runs, there's some unlucky video that is just getting a terrible sort of QOE. In the same experiment, the flows using Minerva, the videos using Minerva have again, a much smaller spread in quality. And in particular, we're avoiding these, you know, these outliers, these, these videos that are just very unlucky and, and they, get, uh, they get very poor experience. Importantly, Minerva does this without actually uh, getting a larger share of bandwidth overall. If I compare how much Minerva is achieving relative to cubic, in these scenarios, it's about 50% of the bandwidth, uh, which shows you that on average, it is fair to uh, these competing cubic videos. Um, finally, let's look at a dynamic experiment where we have videos that come and go over time. So it's not some static set of videos. Um, in this case, we're generating videos as a Poisson process. And um, for this experiment, um, I'm gonna actually, all the videos are identical because what I wanna show you is how uh, Minerva can take advantage of dynamic differences between the video sessions, like the playback buffer that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk to improve their quality of experience. So, the CDF on the right-hand side shows the, uh, this is a distribution of rebuffering time across these videos. You can see that most videos don't actually have rebuffering, but the ones that, for the ones that do, Minerva reduces the amount of rebuffering, um, the total rebuffering time by average of 47%. Now showing you just this graph would not have been meaningful because you know, Minerva may be getting this improvement in rebuffering at the expense of quality, but, the other CDF shows that the perceptual quality is essentially identical to what Cubic is able to achieve in the same scenario. So this shows you uh, a more realistic sort of example of how videos can tap into this global buffer pool to avoid rebuffering um, using dynamic differences and prioritizing certain videos over others. So um, with that, I'll summarize. You know, in, in this talk, I uh, spoke about two different ways in which um, we can use contextual information to make better decisions about um, bit rate uh, choices and congestion control for video streaming. Uh, we saw that networks are not created equal and uh, learned ABR algorithms can um, optimize their control policy for specific network characteristics to improve performance. We also saw that videos are not created equal and different videos value bandwidth differently based on both the nature of the content and uh, dynamic sort of session state. And a QOWARE transport protocol or QOWARE congestion control protocol can use these differences to optimize bandwidth allocations. Um, these are just two examples of how this kind of contextual decision-making can be used in video streaming. I think there's a lot of other opportunities. Um, for example, in, in, the, in the research literature, we're starting to see these ideas of things like content-based compression, uh, super resolution techniques, and I think, um, all of these approaches that, uh, that take advantage of uh, the nature of, of, of a video stream um, have a lot of promise. So with that, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this interesting keynote and let's give him a virtual applause. You can use the reaction button below for that.
thank you very much. Uh, I'm trying <laughs> to do this, go immediately to the uh, Q&A and hopefully you can see them. Uh, participants uh, can also upvote uh, the questions they would like to see, but we will start with the first question here on top by Thomas, uh, about what is your opinion uh, on the uh, machine learning ABR rain, arms race, uh, like the robust MPC, PNC, Boboe, and so on, and to which extent are these solutions suitable to cover also the expected higher throughput variations introduced by small cells uh, like in 5G? Um, so, you know, I think, uh, I mean, I think it's 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 very natural to see, you know, continual improvements. I don't expect, you know, I don't expect that to stop sort of anytime soon. There's going to be more schemes, um, and 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 better schemes, you know, developed. Uh, uh, the, um, you know, this question of sort of um, higher throughput variations. I mean, I think. This is really the, this is exactly sort of the purpose of, of, of this, I think this, this whole line of work of uh, uh, essentially, I think where a lot of this work is going to go is, uh, uh, you know, perhaps toward model specialization, you know, so um, uh, yeah, a policy that's, that's used for, for 5G networks is going to be um, you know, we have to detect that that's that's kind of the network that we're on, and then we can um, we can specialize a policy for that. Uh, and uh, you know, it's also sort of perhaps I mean things that haven't been explored, but I suspect would be very interesting would be to also look at sort of policies. It's not just type of networks, like also region. You know, like a a policy. You know, when you're streaming video from some developing country. Um, uh, the, the networks have very different characteristics I and mean, this is pretty obvious. Uh, and uh, that's, I think, where basically this whole like line of work um, can, can, can be very fruitful. Um, yeah, the question of what comes next in this, I, I don't know. I mean, um, online learning, like is, <laughs> is something that uh, seems very natural. And again, I think you know, people haven't really done in this, in this context yet. Hey, thank you. I guess we have some time for, for some more questions. Uh, the next one is coming from Ali, uh, and uh, he's just wondering uh, what happens if the clients can cheat mm. about their utilities in Minerva uh, so they can abu abuse, in a sense, uh, this system? Yeah, so uh, good question. So the, you know, the, the way we we've been imagining this is the utility functions are not something that the, the clients actually um, control or determine. Um, it's something that a you know, video provider uh, gets to uh, set for their different videos. Um, uh, so, you know, if you think of that whole process of coming up with these utility functions that I talked about, that's, that's actually all entirely an offline process, just, just to be clear. So I can take a video and then I can look at, um, you know, it, at different starting states. Um, what would happen if I have bandwidth at a certain level uh, in terms of perceptual quality for that video? And so a provider would come up with these utility curves. Um, and in fact, these utility curves really belong on the video server. I mean, you could put them on the client as well because you do have to get feedback anyway, but you could very well do it on the video server. And the only thing that you're getting from the client is its own state that says, what is like my current playback buffer? Um, it, I mean, if clients could lie about that, I think then you would still, um, you know, it, it would still create potential abuse. Like if I um, always claim that I don't have any video buffered, let's say, uh, so that I can get an advantage. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, but that's something that I think a, kind of a, um, you know, a, 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 it's a, like a provider would have to would have to harden harden that so it's it's uh, it's not open to sort of arbitrary tampering. Um, one other thing that I should mention about this because I didn't get a chance to talk about is uh, this interface that says you know set a weight 
for a connection and it determines how aggressive it is, it's actually a pretty convenient interface to work with because it's very easy to bound, you know? So, and actually we show examples of this in the paper that I can say, you know, I want to get QOE fairness, but no client is allowed to have a weight that's more than three. Um, so you're mm -hmm. never allowed to be more aggressive than three times like a, you know, a, a qubit connection. And, and, and so that would be one way of also kind of putting boundaries around what, what this kind of approach can do. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. I guess, yeah, we have time for more questions. Uh, so the next one is coming from Babak. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, keep in mind that uh, rebuffering itself has its own factor in your QE formula in trace driven evaluation. Could you please elaborate more about the smoothness penalty? How do you calculate these penalties? Ah, okay. So I hope I'm understanding the question. So the the so the the smoothness penalty for a particular video uh, trace or particular video is just going to be based on the sequence of bit rates that you choose. So that is something that's actually, once I know the sequence of bit rates that a policy chooses, I can compute that smoothness penalty sort of independently of any rebuffering penalty. The, the rebuffering depends on network conditions, of course. So in, for, for the rebuffering penalty, that's where we need our simulator that's going to uh, you know, simulate at a particular point in network trace how long it takes to download a chunk. And it sees if you know, it, it, it simulates the playback buffer dynamics of the player um, and it determines how long it would have rebuffered. Um, uh, so that's where the simulator is needed. The smoothness penalty is actually a lot easier because it only depends on the sequence of bit rates. Okay, good, thank you. We can get a few more, I think. Uh, next one is coming from Rajiv. Uh, how would an algorithm like Pensive behave with computing Dash players on the same home network? Can the model be extended or is additional bandwidth orchestration still required? Yeah, this is a very good question. So it's, it's actually not something that we've looked at, you know, to just give you the, the, the straight answer. The, um, my uh, sort of one, I mean, I think the question is actually about fairness. You know, if, if you have different video streams, let's say using a learned policy, um, it, could, could it be biased towards one, you know, versus the other? The only thing I can say is there, there is some level of isolation about like in that ABR, you know, mechanism because there's an underlying congestion control algorithm that um, it gets to sort of determine how bandwidth is shared. Uh, so if, um, this isn't something that we've, we really tried to do or we experimented, but if you have, um, like, I believe that if you have sensible ABR policies that will try to use whatever bandwidth the transport gives them, you know, they're, they're not overly conservative, then their bandwidth share can be dictated by the congestion control protocol. Um, uh, but, but it's, it's, it's a very sort of nice, uh, you know, exercise to see if Pensieve's learned policies actually do that. And also to see if uh, if they don't, if there's a if there's a way of if there's a way of fixing it. I my guess would be that this is the kind of thing that some reward shaping would easily fix because you, what you just want is you want to make sure that the ABR um, tries to use whatever bandwidth the network gives it, basically, um, and, and therefore the congestion controller can drive what the bandwidth allocation is. Excellent, thank you. Next question is from Abdel Haq. Pensive parameters tuning may differ, depends on the environment. So network condition, content features, encoding parameters. So how can you automate the tuning process in such a way those parameters are selected dynamically during a session? Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, the, in, in our design, this state representation and the policy representation um, is, um, so the network parts of it are not sort of based on the, you know, the environment. There's a sequence of, let's say, measurements that you can collect in any environment about what happens, is, let's say, for the last K chunks. Um, there are some things that um, do vary. So for instance, this is again, another thing I didn't have time to talk about when we, um, in the original paper, we had a fixed sequence of 
bit rates that you could you could pick. But when we wanted to deploy in Facebook's environment, of course, every video has a different encoding parameter. Um, you know, they have different bit rate levels, different number of bit rates. Um, and so we needed an architecture that would be uh, more flexible and it could generalize to across these different uh, encoding parameters. And what we did there is, so if you look at the paper, we, we defined the architecture in a slightly more general way so that um, the policy takes as input some features about every encoding parameter. And then you can repeat that calculation for all encoding parameters and then make a decision. Um, uh, so the, the policy was kind of expanded so that it, it would share parameters across multiple encoding levels and therefore be flexible. Um, so I think like techniques like that have been used in a lot of different types of systems to have more generalizable you know, representations of a policy. Um, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question about tuning. It might refer to things like hyperparameter tuning of the training process and things like that. I mean, that is an issue with a lot of ML algorithms, you know, for, for what it's worth, like in a system like Pensieve, we haven't found that to be um, a very big bottleneck. Like it's uh, across sort of a range of these parameters. Like you have to sort of like do some tinkering to get the algorithm to converge. But once you do that, um, across a range of parameters, you do get reasonably stable sort of training behavior. Thank you. Uh, I think we can get one last question and it is uh, about uh, uh, the video on demand versus low latency live streaming. So will Pensy work or how well it will work uh, for such low latency live streaming scenarios? Um, yeah, that's another very good question. I, I think that, um, uh, so, I mean, the, the architecture itself certainly would apply to uh, a low latency scenario. I mean, the difference is that, um, you know, you're constrained on buffer occupancy, basically, you, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna have to, you have a much smaller sort of much tighter budget for, for buffer occupancy. So the system would train, you know, and, and, and um, in terms of how well it would do, I think, my guess, and again, this is not something that we've actually you know, uh, attempted, but my guess would be that um, the types of improvements that Pensieve can provide for video on demand will not translate as well to a, a, you know, a live streaming scenario. It's just because you have, you have much less room for optimization. You know, if you're, so for instance, suppose you had a playback buffer that had to be zero, like you had no room for, for playback. Then, then there's not much you can do. You can sort of learn something about the, maybe the variance of network bandwidth and try to figure out a right threshold below the estimated network bandwidth to be in, but that's pretty much it. Whereas when you have a playback buffer, that's when some planning aspects come into this problem. And, and this notion of like, you know, strategy in, in making decisions becomes more relevant. That's why I feel like the gains are gonna be larger in the video on demand setting for this kind of scheme. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think we should close now uh, for this Q and A. Uh, I see there are still lots of interesting questions here on, on Slido. Uh, and we invite you, Mohammed, to also join the discussion on Slido and, and respond there. Uh, we, we marked all the questions we addressed right now uh, as answered well, but we will bring them back and, and feel free to discuss with the, with the community here uh, and to, to dive into that uh, community. Uh, but I think now it's uh, time again for a virtual uh, applause uh, on, on Zoom. So please do so. Thank you very much uh, for joining. Thank you so uh, and, much for having and, me. And, 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 and stay safe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you too. Everyone where you are right now. And I think we now move directly to the next session, if I'm right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, really appreciate it. So I guess it's